Welcome to Ruach al Fikr, the Abu Dhabi Festival Debates. This is the fourth year the festival has been holding debates, bringing together experts, diplomats, cultural leaders from around the world to engage with people of Abu Dhabi to feed their intellectual appetite. This morning, we hope to feed your intellectual appetite. Um, the subject of this morning's discussion is arts and audiences. Some may say that the audience is the art's largest investor. It's bigger than any other funder you can imagine. Without audiences, what do we do? But what is the definition of what we're talking today? Really, it's about audience development. Audience development is a planned and targeted process which involves programming, arts education, marketing, and working together to contribute to the organization's overall objectives. With an audience, we create engaging, meaningful experiences and encounters. We make people feel part of a community and make them help them help them realize who they are and who they want to be. So today we'll be talking about the wonderful experiences that our panel has um, will will share with us today. Um, let me introduce our panel now. Nawal Al Qasimi is public programming and outreach officer, and uh, at the Sharjah Art Foundation, which she joined in two thousand and ten. Um, she's responsible for creating relationships with the local community, with local organisations, and in the last year she's be become a very treasured friend of the Abu Dhabi Music and Arts Foundation. On my right is Jonathan Mills, Festival Director and Chief Executive of the Edinburgh International Festival since 2006. So he's come all the way from chilly Scotland to a slightly warmer Abu Dhabi. Jonathan has, is one of Australia's most experienced festival directors, previously holding the artistic director role at the Melbourne International Arts Festival, the Melbourne Mille Millennium Eve celebrations, as well as the Brisbane Biennial International Music Festival. He is a visiting professor at the Universities of Edinburgh and Edinburgh Napier, and in 2011, he was appointed by Queen Elizabeth II, Officer of the Order of Australia. Thank you very much for coming to us. And finally, last but very much not least, Ruth McKenzie, Director of the London 2012 Cultural Olympiad. All of you saw the Olympics on television, all the wonderful cultural celebrations around the sporting competition. This is the lady that created it. Um, the London 2012 Festival engaged over 25,000 artists from every country participating in the Olympic Games. Over 200 commissions and an attendance of more than 19 million people. It was the UK's largest festival. Previously, Ruth was General Director of Scottish Opera, Manchester International Festival, and she has been an expert advisor for the British government for the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. Thank you very much for joining us. So let me turn to Noir first. Noir, tell us a little bit about how the Sharjah Art Foundation approaches audience development. Um, because as at, you're at the forefront in terms of community outreach and public programming, aren't you? That's right. Um, first of all, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. It's really my pleasure to speak to all of you today. Um, at the Sharjah Art Foundation, as Lisa mentioned, I work with community outreach. And um, the, main, the main focus of the foundation is to introduce um, a new kind of, a new approach to interacting with and learning about art to the community. And we do that by a series of public um, education and community programs. So we work within the community to reach and build our audiences. And um, maybe if I could give a quick overview about the foundation. So the Sharjah Art Foundation um, is kind of overseeing the Sharjah Biennial, or Bina al-Sharqa in Arabic. Um, and we're on our 22nd edition, so it's been 22 years. It happens every two years. 
and this is the main focus of the, f of the foundation. Now, the biennial has been going on for 22 years, and the art scene in Sharjah had, had been starting since the early 80s with the Emirates Fine Arts Society, um, and then with things like the book fair, um, ch the children's festival, which no longer exists now, um, the Sharjah Theatre Days. So the, the art scene and the arts audience in Sharjah has kind of been exposed to 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 the to art and, and culture for quite a while, but we found that there was a growing need for more than just from our side, for more than just the biennial that comes every two years. We bring these people from all over the world, place them in the middle of the old city of Sharjah, and then they're gone. And we felt like we need to engage more with the community, so that's when the foundation was formed. It was only formed in 2009, and with it. Um, there came public programs, education programs, um, a residency program, a production program where we would give a grant to an artist to produce a work. Um, we do publishing now. We work with other institutions to publish books. Um, we are working on creating studio spaces in Sharjah and in Khafakan for local artists, local meaning people that live and work in the UAE. Um, so uh, there are a number of things that came out of the foundation because of what the audience needed. So it was kind of taking what people wanted. It was our role to kind of take what the people wanted and create uh, these existing programs for them. Amazing. You're clearly working rather hard. Yeah. <laughs> Ru, I, I, I mentioned some statistics earlier, very <laughs> staggering statistics at that. Tell me a little bit about um, the audience development and, and, and building the audiences around London 2012. Um, I'm going to try and, and give you examples that are useful because uh, it is not so useful to know that much about how to organise the largest festival in the history of the UK to celebrate the coming of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, I find I have now an expertise that is, is of no use to anybody anywhere in the world. But I think within the program that we uh, came up with, there are some very um, replicable models. There are some things that could be useful for you. Um, so as you heard, it was, it was a large festival. We had over 19 million attendances. Uh, it was over the entire United Kingdom, so from the very northmost island of Scotland, the Shetland Islands, to the very most southern islands south of Cornwall, the Isles of Scilly. It was in Northern Ireland, in Wales, in Scotland, all over the UK, even though it was called the London 2012 Festival. It, we aimed to reach every member of the community in every corner of the country. Um, uh, there are very few good examples of how to make a festival in an entire country. If you think about it, most good festivals happen in cities, like Jonathan's wonderful Edinburgh Festival, or they happen in fields, like the Glastonbury Festival. They do not happen in an entire country. So uh, some of the ways that we approached uh, reaching communities over such a large geographic space I think are useful for you to think about for your projects in the future. And the first was about partnership. So the only way that I could curate, program a festival around the whole of the country was by relying on good friends. So my first piece of advice to you is make some good friends. Uh, you will always find them useful as you work in the arts. So I had to rely on good friends in cultural institutions all around the UK to deliver a festival programme. In my previous jobs, which have been more normal, uh, like at the Manchester International Festival, um, or at the Barbican Centre, or at Nottingham Playhouse, or Chichester Festival, uh, I could produce a festival myself. But when I have such a large part area of the country, I, I cannot be the producer. I have to have friends who will actually come up with and deliver a program for me and with me. So the first rule is you must uh, begin to develop the networks of partners who, when you need to deliver a program, you can turn to and who will share your values and share your taste. 
And this is perhaps the most important rule to be successful in the arts, I would say. Um, the second rule I wanted to suggest to you is to think very seriously about the different sorts of audiences because it is not possible to offer uh, a program that will please every single person. You must choose who you wish to work with and talk to in your audiences. Um, one of our biggest priorities for the London 2012 Festival was to reach young people and engage with young people. And so uh, we needed to think about who the artists were who would excite young people. And sometimes we chose very famous artists. You will see, if you look at the slides, uh, you will see Jay-Z. We had Florence and the Machine. We had pop stars from around the world, Rihanna, uh, many others. But also, uh, for us, it was important to introduce artists that the young people might not know. So new artists, ex more experimental artists. And there, we thought a lot about how to present work in a way that young people would find interesting. And there were a couple of um, success stories. First of all, uh, we offered a lot of work for free. So of the 19 million attendances, over 15 million attendances paid no money for their tickets. They had a free chance. And if, if the work is free, then, then the audience will be brave about risking their time. They are not risking their money, they are just risking their time. You can invite them to experiment, to see an artist who they do not know. Uh, the second, um, I think, interesting point is that we experimented with pop-up programming. So what do I mean by pop-up? Well, I mean, we did not put the event in the brochure. We did not tell people in advance what time, what place, what we were going to do. We created a festival environment and we encouraged people to give us their email and their phone numbers. Mm -hmm. And then we would, at the very last minute, say, come to Piccadilly Circus, for example. Come to this public square in the centre of London that normally has traffic going round and round it because for two days only we have closed it. There are no cars, no buses and we have created a circus. And you can come free to see a circus in a place called Piccadilly Circus. So the title, of course, was Piccadilly Circus Circus. <laughs> <laughs> and 150,000 people came, and they came with 24 hours notice. Uh, and of course, the people who came are the people who will respond on Twitter, on Facebook, who listen to the local radio, because the BBC helped us, um, who, who will listen not just to um, our own uh, social media, but also to our friends. So we asked famous comedians like Stephen Fry to tweet on our behalf. We asked Yoko Ono. We asked the Mayor of London. Um, but we found different ways to talk to and engage a new young audience. And this, I think, is a very interesting experiment that anybody can do in their future work. You do not need to spend two years closing um, the major traffic island in the centre of London. By the way, the last time it had been closed was for the victory celebrations at the end of the Second World War in 1945. Uh, and it is quite a thing to get the planning permissions to close such a public space. But my main lesson is, actually at any scale, in any way, if you wish, you can find the new networks to engage with new audiences. It just takes uh, the determination and the imagination um, to engage and find and talk to those new people. Thank you. Many words of wisdom there from Ruth.
Turning to Jonathan. Now, Jonathan, Edinburgh International Festival is a bastion of the festival circuit internationally, and you engage audiences not just as spectators, but as participants as well. Speed of Light last year, which uh, we experienced, was a phenomenal activity. It was indeed part of the um, Ruth's Festival. It was a participant in this huge undertaking that Ruth took the length and breadth of the UK. Um, let me talk, first of all, just picking up and reinforcing one of the points that Ruth has made, and then I will talk a little bit about the Edinburgh International Festival. And then I will talk about, mindful of the fact that I'm talking to a group of people who are very interested in design, interior design, and curation. Visual design is mostly what you're studying here, so I'm going to try and frame my remarks in ways that I hope um, are helpful to the ways in which you are thinking about your own studies. I just want to pick up on this point that Ruth made about connecting with places in an interesting way. Because what the, the great power of what Ruth did, I'm, I was very pleased to be part of it, a small part of it, but. The, the great power of what Ruth achieved um, on behalf of the artists of the UK um, last summer was that she um, asked us to think about ourselves and our relations to our communities in very different ways. She asked us to imagine what was possible um, if we thought of ourselves as a coherent community rather than a thousand disparate communities. Just for a moment, she said, let's be one. And it was a really powerful thought. Imagine every experience you have ever had in your life with every person that you've ever met and that for one moment you brought all of those people into one place and in one moment. That's in a sense what Ruth did across the UK last year. And for me, one of the things that was also very powerful about the achievement of, at the core of this Olympic undertaking, and it was Olympian in its scope, was that it resonates strongly with something that I hold very close to my heart whenever I am thinking about the nature of what is a festival and where is its location. The great French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty made a very powerful statement. He said, just as places are sensed, senses are placed. What I mean by that is this idea that when you live in a place, all of your senses, the way you touch, you feel, you look, you listen, everything that is, that is human about you is engaged with understanding and exciting that actual place. So just as places are sensed, just as we sense the world around us, from early childhood, we navigate our nursery. From later, when we are teenagers, we sense um, our neighborhood. As you are at university, you have a different sense of the scope of your lives. So, but you are always making a place. Placing is about sensing. Just as places are sensed, senses the way in which we sense the world around us are placed. We don't place our senses into an ether in the middle of nowhere. We place them into our intimate experiences of the world. Your cultures, your cultural differences, your cultural attributes, your cultural values define the way in which you make sense, literally make sense of the world around you. And I believe that this is at the core of what a festival does. For the moment that a festival is on, for the one moment that I've asked you to think about everyone you've ever met 
every experience you've ever thought about in one instant, that's in a sense like a festival. Ruth asked 27,000 people in the UK who are artists to in one period of time imagine coming together of a convergence. What I do in my Edinburgh Festival is every year I ask a disparate group of artists to come and make sense, bring their values and their differences and think about how they will contribute to this place at that moment. It's a moment in time. Your great traditions of poetry, your great epic traditions um, in Arabic culture, your spiritual um, traditions are very attuned to this idea of a journey in time. Our lives, what are they? They are a journey in time. They are very brief. And the festival is a way of us as a community sensing the idea that we are something, we are part of something bigger. So let me tell you about a little bit about the Edinburgh International Festival. Ruth mentioned that the Piccadilly Circus Circus started in 1945. It started in 1945 to the relief of a victory parade. At last, this war is over. At last, the atrocities of the wholesale slaughter of millions of lives lost innocently could come to an end. It didn't stop in London with that victory parade. I believe in the very deepest sense that victory parade needed to take itself into not winning the war, but winning the peace. Learning how we would live together in some kind of community and in some kind of harmony. It was not easy. The winter of 1946 was particularly bleak. I wasn't born, but we have the records. It was a very bad year. There was food rationing. There was still petrol rationing. There was no way that a place that had been bombed like the UK could suddenly pick up its life in a way that resumed normality. It was five or six years earlier that any sense of what normal life might have been it was long forgotten. And in any case, no single family had escaped the tragedy of such a momentous and horrible occasion. So what are we to do? Are we to just ignore what happened and try to pretend it didn't exist? Of course not. That would be foolish. <coughs> what had to happen was deliberate steps had to be taken to repair, to recover, to heal, to bind those, not wounds that were physical, there were many of those, but the, the, those invisible wounds the emotional longing, the loss of a friend, um, a family member, a loved one. Naturally, one turned, as one does always in these circumstances, not to the mechanical nature of how we measure our lives, but to those intangible moments of how we value our lives. When everything is taken from us, what remains is our values. What remains is the bits that we will never surrender. And the bits that we don't surrender are our culture, are our beliefs, are our values. And I'm suggesting that the festivals that Ruth puts on and that I put on are symptoms, are symbols of those values and those beliefs. And in 1947 in Edinburgh, the very first year the festival started, it was not an easy time to start a big cultural event. It wasn't a plate time of richness. As I said, food and petrol rationing was still very prevalent. The winter before had been particularly harsh. So it was a miracle in a way that this festival started in the worst of times 
for the best of reasons. The Lord Provost, effectively the Lord Mayor of the, the, the city leader of Edinburgh at that moment, said quite generously, quite remarkably, let this be a festival to embrace the world. When you think about those words, they're powerful. He was not saying we will go back into our shell and we will heal our own wounds with our own family alone. He says, no, that is not the solution. The solution to the problems of the world is not to retreat, it's to remain open-minded, to be a spirit of open and inclusive generosity. And so it was in that very first festival that an orchestra was invited that two years earlier, every member of that orchestra, although they were musicians, although they were people of peace, they were enemies. So if that orchestra had arrived in the UK just 24 months earlier, they would have been taken by authorities and they would have been imprisoned. But here this orchestra, the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, the orchestra of the birth place of the, of the of literally of the birth country of Hitler, the feared enemy, was respected not because of its enmity, but because of the beauty of its sound. And so if we can find through the arts a space whereby differences can be celebrated and understandings enriched, then I believe this is the perfect place to start to talk about audiences and arts. And so I leave you with the thought that my friend Michael Colgan, who is a great playwright, a great theatre producer in Dublin, in Ireland, he said, if all we ever do is talk about the imagination of the artist, we have failed. We must ensure that whatever we do is an inspiration to the imagination of the audience. It lights a fire for everybody who comes there. And it certainly did in Edinburgh in 1947. Ruth's statistics are very impressive. In fact, unprecedented. I don't think that the ministers who gave her this opportunity truly believed until they were confronted with the reality of it, just how successful it was. And then, of course, they wanted to keep it going and own it forever, which was not the point either. Um, but in Edinburgh, although at a smaller level, we have done some remarkable work in its pure statistics as well. Since 1947, this festival, 66 years later, is no longer one festival, but eight festivals in August, 12 festivals during the year. These festivals together welcome, um, in August alone, close to three million um, ticket buyers, so three million tickets are sold, close to a million people come to a, a city that is a population of 450,000. So it's a huge increase in the population. And of course, one of the things that is a very great benefit is that it is also, apart from the fact that it is a great symbol, it is a great example, it is also good business. It's one of those great moments where doing something well, doing something for the right reasons, is also economically fortuitous. It's also true that that's what happened with Ruth. Think about a sponsor getting 15 million free per people um, tickets. There's very few businesses that can achieve that. In my own case, I am part of a consortium of festivals that are worth to the economy of the United Kingdom, Scotland and Edinburgh approximately, and I will put it in American dollars, approximately 450 million 
American dollars in one month. So it's big business. So obviously there are many other things that I want to talk about given that you are a group of interior designers, graphic designers and curators about the way in which you in your professional careers can in fact start to engage with the work that people like Ruth and myself and our colleague from Sharjah, we all do as public, um, public enterprises and the, and the physical shapes of what we do and how, I mean, it's very interesting, isn't it, that Ruth describes some of the work that she did as a pop-up, mm. as a very temporary thing that just emerges like a flower blooming for a moment. And I think this is a wonderful way of thinking about how we design, how we think about the very temporary and the permanent structures that help support the work of a festival, help support the work of a cultural life that we can all share in. Thank you, Jonathan. I want to go back to the idea of geographical pl places and building on what you were talking about, placing the senses in a sense of place. Um, ADMAF has been working very closely with the wonderful artist Christo, who I think some of you have met, yeah? Um, as you know, 160 kilometers from here, near Liwa, in, next to the village of Hamim, he is building the Mastaba of Abu Dhabi, the largest sculpture of, in the world and his only permanent work. Um, Obviously, there is going to be a whole audience development plan put together to activate that sculpture and make it become not only part of the environment, but part of all of us, part of all of you, part of the contemporary cultural identity of Abu Dhabi. Nawar, I want to ask you, in terms of the, the public programming works that you do, um, I've been to the Sharjah Biennial and it's thrilling to walk into parts of Sharjah that you would never normally walk into and find fantastic installations. And just watching the people that walk past, families, children, expat, I mean, it's the whole spectrum of Sharjah society. Does that allow people then to enter into the galleries, the more formal spaces where you ex exhibit. Tell us how you catch your audience. Hook well, them. really, um, the, first, the first thing is that you have to actually look at your audience and ask yourself, who are the people? Who are the people of Sharjah? Who are the people of Abu Dhabi? Who are the people that live here? The audience in Sharjah is very mixed, and the area in which we operate, which is now being called the heart of Sharjah, and it's becoming the cultural kind of hub in charge of, like the arts and cultural hub in charge of, is a place where you have um, a lot of old souks. It's where the old souk is. I think a lot of people know it, souk and jadim in Sharjah. It's like the middle of Sharjah. And there's, you've got the old souks, and then you've got, um, you've got the banks around Bank Street. So you've got kind of the more corporate side. You've got the little shops facing the sea. So you've got the workers that work on the ports. You've got the laborers that live in all the buildings around that area, and then you've got the museums and the audience, the families that take their kids to the museum, <laughs> and then you have kind of the people who are visiting, so the tourists. It's a very mixed and diverse audience, mm -hmm. and the work that we do, the per programs that we do, and our aim is to reach the public. So we're not looking for um, people from, not only the, the people who are working within the arts and culture field, the people who fly to see biennials and to see art and who do this as part of their daily life, as their job, but also the everyday people that kind of live and work in Sharjah. So the first, um, the first way is to bring what you're doing to the public, so making your art public, not, putting thing, not only keeping things inside the gallery. A lot of people are intimidated by going into a big gallery space or a museum or a big building. And in, in a, way, a way that we've overcome this, and I'll give an example from the last biennial, is that we looked at the different nationalities in Sharjah and did a survey of all the languages spoken. And then we, when we presented the last biennial two years ago, we had the wall text next to each piece in different languages. 
So we had people coming and reading something in Farsi. The men that would work in the Iranian souk would come and read the wall text in Farsi. They wouldn't understand it in Arabic or English. They would understand it in Farsi. Maybe it would not. Maybe they wouldn't understand it like people who were curators or artists or people from that field would, but they would still engage with it. And when we place something in a public square, it's automatically inviting them to look at it, to interact with it, and over time they've become used to it. So now, um, the other day, we were walking down um, past the souk, and, and these guys were, that worked in the shops were saying, thank you for this, it's great, we love it. And, and if, if we were just confining ourselves to a closed building, a lot of people wouldn't come in because they don't feel welcome. Mm -hmm. So when you put yourself out there, you, regain, you gain this new audience. Mm -hmm. and, and over time, they become familiar with it, and then they learn that it actually this is for you, and it is OK to come in here, and you should go into the museum, and you should go into that building, and you should open that door. Because a lot of time, people feel like they're not allowed to look at things. They don't know why it's there. Um, and this is kind of one of the problems that we face, is telling people that actually, what we're doing in Sharjah, for example, the biennial in Sharjah is for you. It's for you guys. It's for everybody. It's not for the international arts crowd. It's not for, you know, people who work in institutions. It really is for the public. It's moving um, from the passive to active participation. Yeah. And also a lot of the works um, in the biennial, or a lot of the work that we try to produce, we try to make it um, audience friendly in a way that people can interact with it. So it's. There's always works that are going to be things that you can't touch or you can't interact with, but there are also a lot of things that you can actually touch. I don't know if you saw images, but there is an image of a woman on a swing in a mirror groom. And that's a piece by Tilo Frank, who's this amazing artist, and he's created this big black box that you go in. And then there's a mirror groom, you close the door and you swing. And if you look back up while you're swinging, it looks like a grid, so it looks like you're in the matrix. And if you're swinging, your reflection starts to disappear. And it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's also a lot of fun. And you know, there's a sign that says one person at a time, so you feel like you're going into you know, getting on a ride at a, a fun fair. fair. <laughs> at a fair. <laughs> but also, it's very serious. There's a wall text that explains the work. Um, you're very careful. You interact with it. Some people love it, and some people say, you know, I don't understand what this is. But it's a lot of fun. But it's a response. It's a response. And that's the start. I think we, you always have to try to do more because people are so accustomed to seeing things on a wall in a closed room or on paper in a book so I and think not allowed to touch and not allowed it to you touch. don't have to stand yeah. but, but also this is a piece of art that actually the the person the audience creates themselves along with the artist exactly. so it is asking not just for an audience to look it's asking for them to do and as they do they are creating the piece in fact exactly Thank you, Noir. I want to move on, it, 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 remaining on the issue of geographical spaces. Um, technology. Um, the London 2012 Festival, as you said earlier, you engaged people in the Shetland Isles of Scotland, right down to the Isles of Scilly in the, in the south of, of England. What role did technology play in uniting the audience? Um, Yes, I, I, I will answer that question. I just wanted first, though, to pick up on, on your point about participation, because I think it is so important, and also your point about public space. I mean, I, I'll leave Jonathan to describe Speed of Light, because I think it is such a perfect example of a commission that was on it, this um, uh, piece, this, this extraordinary uh, landmark in Edinburgh, this, this mountain in the middle of the city. Uh, and the piece was created by exactly the audience. It only existed really through ordinary people becoming a, a work of art. Uh, but I think it is, it is enormously um, important that, uh, that the development of your audience's creativity is part of your program, that you do not separate the, the creativity of the artist from uh, the audience. That, that you have in, your, in a program of work pieces where the audience can themselves learn work. Um, you will see here uh, a different example. Um, it was a partnership with the BBC, our broadcaster, with the Tate Gallery, one of our best museums, and with the animators Ardman, who make Wallace and Gromit. You might have seen Wallace and Gromit, a cartoon 
that won an Oscar, actually. Uh, and they offered the chance for children under the age of 12 to learn how to do animation. And some of them went to real workshops in a room like this where they, they learnt, they were taught how to make animated cartoons. But many of them learnt on, on online workshops. 34,000 children learnt how to become animators. And then they had the chance to contribute to the making of one film. Um, and this one film, The Itch of the Golden Knit, uh, a stupid title, created by a child under the age of 12. Um, uh, this one film is in the Guinness Book of World Records now as a film with the largest creative team ever in the history of making films because all of these children are part of this film. And it won a children's BAFTA, a BAFTA award, which is a big uh, prize in the UK. But it's a, it's a great example of how to create a piece of work, uh, which is a real piece of work. I mean, it's a wonderful film, actually, because Aardmans are genius at editing. But they have managed to make it uh, a celebration of not just their own world-class talent, but the talent of all these thousands of children. Um, and I firmly believe, not only, of course, did this get a great audience, you think about all these children, their friends, their mums, their dads, um, but I hope that out of those children, there will be some children who become the next generation of world-class um, creative talent. Um, so I have begun to answer the digital point, but... Um, and we did a lot of work digitally. We commissioned work that only happened on the internet or was only broadcast. And we commissioned work that was partly um, existed on the internet and partly existed in the real world, like the itch of the golden knit. Uh, but I think that we only began the process, actually. Um, for me, the, the process of digital art is still in the very early days. I think that we are still not seeing truly great art on the internet. Um, often the art uh, needs still the real physical environment um, to become real. So one of the pieces, we worked with Yoko Ono, who, is, uh, who has done some wonderful work. Um, and we did uh, two projects of hers, Imagine Peace, um, which is a simple uh, moment for peace, which we launched the festival with a call for peace. But also she has a project about smiles, very simple. It is still going. You give her your smile. Um, so you upload, you, have, you take a photo of your, yourself smiling and you upload it to Yoko's place and she is capturing all the smiles in the world. That's it. Uh, so... Uh, it's simple. Is it great art? I don't know. I don't know. I th maybe we have not yet got to the stage of digital art where the art itself is truly great. I would be interested in my colleagues' views. But it is all of our jobs to experiment, mm -hmm. uh, to get to that point. Where we are great, though, I think, is in using the digital dimension of our work to reach wider audiences and new audiences, as I described earlier. Brilliant. Thank you. Jonathan, technology. Well, let me talk to you directly, first of all, to pick up on the point that Ruth made. Let me tell you a little bit about the speed of light. Um, the speed of light was a community participation, pa participation project that was part of the London 2012 Festival and was a collaboration with the Edinburgh International Festival and its other partner festivals. Edinburgh, as I've said, is a city of about 450,000 inhabitants. It's the capital of Scotland. It's a city that, depending on which way you look, will make you realise that you are in a city or actually in a city that has got very clear boundaries. You look towards this um, extinct volcano called Arthur's Seat. And you will think, although the city is behind you, that you are actually in the countryside. So the idea that nature comes very close into the centre 
of Edinburgh is important. And it's an important opportunity because many citizens from Edinburgh go to this place, they climb it. It doesn't matter what the weather is like, however bad, however snowing, there are always people on Arthur's seat. And so we asked um, um, an artist a, as a, a, a what he would call, be, he would like to be described, I guess, as an environmental artist called Angus Farquhar and his arts company NVA to engage with this landscape. And he developed the technology and the concept that everyone in Edinburgh was to be a participant in animating, literally lighting up through the speed of their own actions, the illumination of the idea of light. Um, it's probably on a slide there somewhere. I'm going to shout when it comes yes, up. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, and we could freeze it or something for a moment, but um, don't worry, it'll be, there's thousands of slides, but um, it's it's a it's basically it's an extinct volcano that we invited um, a thousand people a night to walk and run across, but you were equipped with special equip uh, special gear special equipment. You had your own uniform, and your uniform consisted of um, a special energy pack that allowed you to store the, your, the energy that you had built up through your own effort and it turned a light on. So you were creating the, your own light source as you walked. A human battery. A human battery. So we were inviting people to go along the physical journey of this space and engage with that and then look back and see 999 other people doing the same as a trace. So it was like a human chain describing a physical space. It was very, again, it was very simple. It was not exclusive. Anyone could, could do this. Even people who had certain disabilities were able to do it because there were paths for that. So it was as inclusive as we could. But what was mostly uh, powerful about it, it was asking people to literally tread over the ground that was so familiar to them, and yet was very clearly for this there. moment in time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that was what it looked like when you were looking back on it. It was, it was very beautiful at night because there were so many people making this trajectory. And then, of course, we engaged some people who were not exactly professional, but they were um, um, interested in a, in a very different way. They were, um, they were dedicated runners. They were joggers. They were people who were fanatics about their own fitness. And they didn't walk. They ran. And they ran at a different speed. So this idea of speed and light mm. converging. Some people walking, most people walking, some people running. The runners had to agree, although they were chosen from sports organisations the length and breadth of Scotland, they had to agree to a certain level of training. I don't mean physical training, but training in terms of the terrain and training in terms of where they were meant to run and how fast and how slow they were meant to run. And they indeed ran and, and their trajectory was much faster. So you had this extraordinary sense that this physical landscape was for the moments of the festival for three hours every night a giant canvas of light. And it was marvellous mm. for that. It was marvellous. Um, for that reason. And it was available to everyone. What I'm wanting to say here is I want to draw in this notion that Ruth and Noah has, have mentioned about this idea of where we place art and the notion of participation. Because I think where we're getting to is the crux of the challenge that I would like to put to you 
as curators, animators, artistic directors, um, arts leaders, interior designers in the future. What is going to motivate your design? How are you going to think about the location of your own designs yourselves? You are learning about, let's just take a room like this. It's a good example because it's not a very beautiful room. It's a very functional room. But if we are describing this room, we will describe certain things about the volume, certain things about the colour, certain things about the acoustics, the sound. I mean, if I take my microphone off, you can still hear me, but not if I whisper. <laughs> so the acoustics change if I modulate my voice. And we have um, natural light as well as um, electronic light sources. Where is this leading me? You mentioned a very powerful idea that some people are intimidated about going into some kinds of buildings. They don't believe that it is a club that invites them in. The great strength of what Ruth did, and I would like to suggest some of the things that we do in Edinburgh that are powerful, is that we say there is no club that certain people are not allowed to belong to. The great thing that ADMAF is doing with its strong emphasis on education and audience development is it's building this audience and this capacity, this hunger for a future. My question is this, my challenge to you as future designers is what kinds of values are you going to bring to the kinds of buildings that you will build, the kinds of interiors that you will want to build in, interiors or exteriors, because I have a problem. I think we all have a problem. And the problem that I think we have is that we are making fundamentally wrong assumptions about the nature of the infrastructure that politicians think we need. Politicians want to do good work. They want to come to the opening of a building. They want to build something that is of value to the community, they will provide the money for buildings. But so often I see in many countries infrastructure that is either inappropriate for cultural reasons or like why I think ADMAP is so important is that there's a, there's a, there's a cliche that says we build the building and the audiences will follow. It's not necessarily true. Audiences won't follow unless you use great skill, great care, and a long period to develop these audiences. Audiences don't emerge from nowhere. It takes a long time, as you know, 22 years of biennales, um, thousands of hours of, of negotiations, on Ruth's case, with her friends creating this amazing opportunity off the back of existing um, resources. So my question to you is, what kind of buildings would you be building if the values of those buildings were not a certain kind of European idea of a theatre, but your own idea of your community, a souk, a caravan, um, a very particular intervention in the landscape. Because what I want to tell you is that very often what you're being asked to design was actually something that was designed 2,000 years ago in Greece. And it has a roof on it. Or was modified in Italy in the 16th century four, five hundred years ago, and in fact, not necessarily bears anything to the way you live your life, the community you live in, the, the technology you have available. I'm thinking of a building like the Teatro Olimpico in a town like Vicenza. I wish I'd brought a slide. It's a beautiful building, 
but it describes perfectly an architecture that is completely consistent with the way that Italian painters of the 16th century were seeing perspective. And yet, when I read and look at and marvel at, because I cannot read your language, your illuminated manuscripts, when I look at the landscape painting of China, these are fundamentally different ways of looking at the world. And what I would like to explore with you is if you were given a certain freedom to put into physical shape the way you think of the world, I would suggest it would be very different from a very old-fashioned perspective front-on theatre that was beautiful but was designed for a very particular moment in Italy in the 16th century. And it doesn't necessarily relate to your sense of your world. Let's open it up. Jonathan, I'll just ask through a whole tirade of questions at you. Now we want to talk with you and hear your views. Um, let's talk about um, going back to the idea of, of engagement. How, how do you guys engage with the arts? What makes you drop the iPad, turn off OSM, switch off the radio, and go to an art gallery or go to the Corniche and see one of our community events. What makes you engage with the arts as an audience member? Anybody? Activities. Yeah? Activities. <laughs> what, what type of activities? Like if there was activities for like children and uh, teenagers or certain uh, age group, uh, families can go for activities. Um, for me personally, if I f found anything that uh, attracts me or something, um, I, I'd like to um, um, like to explore. I would love to go, even if it was some something I don't know about. So actually, roll your hat, uh, sleeves yeah. up, and get involved. Yeah. Participation. Participation. Thank you. Anybody else? You must be bursting with Trish. <gasps> Thank you very much. Uh, look for something in you that I will not find in iPad and radio. And uh, it might inspire me in the future. Lovely. Lovely answer. Thank you. I actually have a question I'd like to ask. I want to ask you guys, because you are, I think, one of our main audiences. Exactly. And we're always trying to bring everybody over. What is, what is, what is a way that would get you guys to go to something? What, where would you look up, like where would you get your information on an exhibition or an event or a concert or a theater performance? Are you looking at the internet? Are you looking social at networking. social networking? Is that for most of you, social network? What about um, advertising in newspapers? <laughs> Not really. It's a good one. I'm going to take notes. So I can. So effectively, what you're saying is that this is my brochure for my festival this year. They're not going to. I can up. throw it away. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to worry about it. Exactly. These programs. I love to see something. <laughs> <laughs> It's word of mouth as well, isn't it? It's, it's recommendations of your friends and it's, it's setting that trend that people want, want to follow as well, huh? I don't throw it, I throw it on the internet. Yes. Don't, do. don't throw you. away your brochure, put it on the internet. Yes. So you want. Okay. <laughs> I have a little challenge if I'm allowed. Um, I have an offer for you on social network. Um, all of you this year, Ruth mentioned how many people participated in her animation um, opportunity. It's extraordinary when you think that there are 34,000 ch young children mm -hmm. that um, a year before this were not thinking about um, any kind of professional exposure. These are the best animators in the world 
and they are working as a community resource. Fantastic. So I've got a great guy who is a composer. He's living in Massachusetts. He's living in Boston. And he runs um, the music program at Mel Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His name is Todd Makova. And he knows that I'm coming to talk to you today because I tweeted him and told him. And he's part of my festival this year because he's creating a special performance. It's called Festival City. And what he's doing is he's going to, he's asked me to ask you and for you to ask all your friends to send him on our special internet link your impressions of what you, what, I was hesitant to do this because many of you haven't been to Edinburgh. Ruth and I, we can create a sound that reminds us of Edinburgh. He said, no, I don't want people who just have sounds that remind them of Edinburgh. I want people who also have sounds that they can send me that are the invention of what they think Edinburgh should be. So we are asking you, from the little you heard from us this morning, if you are interested, you too can be a composer at this year's Edinburgh International Festival. Go to our website, www.eif, meaning Edinburgh <coughs> International Festival, .co.uk, forward slash, Festival City Music. I will get somebody to write it out and pass it around. And Todd Macover will receive your sounds and he will incorporate them into one of our concerts at this year's festival. I will launch the festival in 20 cities. I am making this request most especially here, but of course everywhere I go. Because what Ruth said is that there is something very important about place, but also distances are vanishing at the same time. It's incredible how this happens. So we have a lot to learn ourselves about how to engage, how to connect with audiences, and how a combination of word of mouth, a certain action, an activity to animate a space, and social network can all converge into the kind of experience that you would enjoy. What I also think is most important about this experience is it's not exclusive. That you shouldn't ever think that this is not for you. It's absolutely for you. And it's for you to not only make, in the sense of this, work like a swing, it doesn't exist without you, but it's also the work that can be shaped like Todd's by your own contributions. Thank you. Great opportunity there. So it's www.festivalcitymusic. Www <laughs> Festival City Music. Slash. Slash Festival City Music. We'll give it to your lovely tutors and they'll circulate it. A fantastic opportunity. And when you, when you download this, you will be sending this material to a laboratory in, for processing in Massachusetts, which will then be used as the basis of a, a, a live performance in Edinburgh, and everyone who is participating will be sent an archival record of the work. May, may I ask a question? Is, is t do you have Twitter here in Abu Dhabi? Yes. Oh, yes. And how many of you are on Twitter? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much everybody, and 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 do you? There are two sorts of accounts. There's the account that has a little lock, which means you can you can say you can accept a friend or not, and then there is the account that has no lock, where anyone in the world can follow you. How many people have an account where anyone in the world can follow you? Not so many, but quite a few. Yeah. Uh, so. So actually, this is the beginning of, of you as, as a publisher, as an artist to the world. Uh, 
So I think what is very interesting about Twitter is now is the time where you can find your voice with 140 characters to talk to people who do not know you. So of course your friends will be following you, but also there will be people, strangers, following you. So it's very interesting to develop your, your voice and your relationships through this now, because this is the beginning of marketing and engaging with audiences. Don't think of this just as a way to tell your friends interesting things about you. It's a way to develop your voice as, as an arts leader or as an artist. Uh, I, it is something I, I started um, when I was started my work for the London 2012 Festival. And, and what I have found, which is exciting and interesting, is that if I am honest only on Twitter, so I will never tell people that I went to a show and it was good, unless I really think it is good. But actually, I, I find that I have, only with the friends I have on Twitter, which is, is only it's 4,000 or so people, but I can make an, I can affect ticket sales. If I say, it, just in my little way, this is really great, uh, then, then I know that arts organizations get a little, a little surge, not a big one, but a little surge. So this is, this is a very small example of uh, engaging new audiences. Of course, if you are Stephen Fry, our famous comedian, um, you know, he crashes websites every time he tells you to buy a ticket or to go to a place because he has so many millions of followers. Yoko Ono also, she has two million followers. But you will know on Twitter that, you know, if the more you uh, broadcast, the more you talk, the more followers you will get because activity drives followers. So it, it, it actually every day, more, more friends will come to listen to you. So this is a wonderful chance for you to experiment on what your voice is, on what... You've heard us talk a lot this morning about values, and, it, and I think this is a really important word. The values, that is, the, 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 the morals, the opinions, the, uh, the taste that you have, um, what art you like, what art you don't like, what you think is right, what you think is wrong. You can shape this as you experiment on Twitter. And I encourage you to do this because, you know, the, the friends you begin to develop now on Twitter, you may well still be talking to and working with in 20 years' time. <coughs> Any questions? We've got another 10 minutes. No? Yes. Um, one of the questions I think the Hold on a second. One of the questions um, that I have, I think with the girls, it'd be interesting for those who are visual arts majors, the artist of the future, to know a little bit more about how you go about selecting artists for the festivals or for the biennales, what that encompasses. Mm -hmm. Noir, do you want to? Sure. <laughs> okay, so with the biennial, um, every two years there's a biennial, and every two years there's a curator. So that curator would create the theme or the idea that the biennial is going to be about. We decide, we tend to step back out of this process. I mean, of course, we have some influence, but we have to have somebody new every single time because otherwise we're repeating ourselves. We're putting out our own messages, our own information, our own thoughts, and it's going to be the same art and the same people and the same ideas. So there's always a curator, and the curator would select the artist. Previously, it was an open call. Actually, when the biennial first started, it was an open call, and they would select artists. But over, th over the years, it's changed, and it's shifted to a selection process by the curator. We, of course, have a lot of programs. We have you know exhibitions year-round. There are things other than the biennial. And we do have artists coming, like younger, up-and-coming artists who would come and say, I'm an artist. This is my work. And for the biennial itself, the curator would select a number of artists and they would present their work. But then for everything else, we would look at their portfolio and we would, you know, if there's, if there's an exhibition that this artist would fit into, then we would select them. 
otherwise we work with we would work with them in other areas because sometimes and I'm going to be very honest a lot of people feel that if they've maybe done a show here and there that they're an amazing artist and you know they need to be in this exhibition and it's not about that but when you have a biennial and you've got that level of work that's produced you have to be very selective but that doesn't mean that we just shut the doors so there are other opportunities so we work on education programs we work on workshops we work on smaller activities and we have the artists um, present their work in different formats I think if you're an artist or an aspiring artist to be I think my number one um, Oh, maybe I could give you two really good tips. Number one is you should always have a portfolio and you shouldn't limit yourself to a certain kind of work because it's something that you studied in college and then you're stuck in this frame. You should experiment and, and you should try a lot of different things. Another thing is get involved. No artist is going to be found if you're sitting behind you know, your computer or if you're sitting, if you're hiding behind your Instagram account or your Twitter account or whatever it is, go to exhibitions, talk to artists, talk to curators, talk to the people involved. Artists love having you visit their studios, having you ask them questions. And they're actually very, I mean, most of them are very approachable and they actually love giving you advice or hearing your feedback. So really, the way for you to get in to get into the kind of the art scene is to be in it, not just by producing art, but by visiting and by getting familiar. You will make friends, you will meet people. And that's, I think, that's going to open a lot of doors. And as Ruth said, that's how you find your own voice as well. That's true. And it has never been so easy. You know, you are so lucky because it is so much easier now to contact an artist, you know, via the internet, as well as to uh, respond to open calls. So open calls still exist all around the world. They're very famously, the Royal Academy in London every summer has a summer exhibition. You know, you, it, is, it has never been so easy to find an open call. But, but the real prize is to make those relationships, as we have been talking about. It's all about those friendships and relationships. And you do that by, by turning up, by asking questions, by being curious, by engaging with artists and curators, by doing the free activities that are available. It, it is easy to make friends, actually, in the arts world. You just have to um, offer praise to the artists that you love. That is the best way to start work as an artist or a curator, is to, my, I have one note always for people who come to train with me as a producer or programmer, and it is to offer detailed and lavish praise. So not just generally to say to an artist they are good, but to explain to them why and how you think they are good and how much you love them. Don't be a groupie, be a critique. Exactly. Well, Jonathan. Yes. So um, I have to say that one of the challenges of my job is to find a way of being a curator that is not only about my personal taste. I think that's one of the big challenges. I'm not suggesting for a moment I'm, I would be pretentious if I said I produce things that I don't like. Of course not. But what I wanted to try and do is find ways in which I myself could also go on a journey. Ruth was referring earlier to one of the really key elements to the success, in my opinion, of this past summer with the Olympic Arts Festival. And it was having a certain element of celebrity and a certain element of discovery. If all of the artists had been famous, there would have been no point. It would have been no discovery, no, no, no excitement at all. If only artists were unknown, it would have been alienating. It would have not had a way in. So in a sense, one is, is, is have playing with the contours of our, one's own, our own collective memories, our own, the, 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 the psyche of our own society. But what I've tried to do in Edinburgh, a festival that is very deliberately curated and has always been so, curated in ways that have sometimes offended. Um, the Edinburgh International Festival invited certain people to its first edition. 
there were some people who were offended that they weren't, were not invited to this party. And they started their own festival called The Fringe, where there is absolutely no curation. It's deliberately an uncurated, an anti-curated festival. Anyone, this meeting could actually be a performance at the Edinburgh International Fringe. The recording of it we could put on later at a fringe venue and Ruth and I could stand and sit there and say how marvellous we thought you all were in Abu Dhabi um, in, in, um, in March and we would discuss the weather and that would be absolutely adequate for a fringe performance. It can be anything you want. But in the case of the International Festival, what I've tried to do is ask a basic question. If I can do anything in the world, what's the journey that I would like to embark on? What's the journey worth taking? And the journey worth taking is something that extends me as well. A journey that is beyond my comfort zone and asks me questions about the world I live in. So I always start somewhere other than the arts about um, the way in which, just for argument's sake, a place like Abu Dhabi is becoming much more important to the world than it might have been uh, geopolitically 25 years ago. The way in which India has a very different um, socially ec and economic makeup. The way in which climate change is fundamentally um, um, being impacted by China. All of these things that are very big political and geographic issues can then find their way into the way in which you think about the program. Because what you're asking artists to do is respond to the, the broad context in which they um, make work. We are all living and breathing the same air. So we want to ask the, an artist who we admire, and I absolutely endorse Ruth's point about um, being very specific as to why you like someone's work. It's a great way to, to, to engender the trust for a, a conversation. But what you want to do is push this artist to say, have you ever thought of your work in relation to one of the existential challenges of our time? Population, climate, um, geography, um, clash of civilizations, many of these things that we take for granted. What it should never be, in my opinion, is arts for only art's sake. If, if the arts is a very inward-looking conversation, it becomes very boring because it doesn't speak to a broader audience. And so in curating, it's very important that you're asking the right broad question to start with. But in the inevitably, in Edinburgh, and like Sharjah, um, the, the, the decision is yours. The decision of what is in this brochure is mine. The decision what is in the Biennale is mine, it is yours. The decision in, in terms of the, of the, of the, the Cultural Olympiad Festival, the London 2012 Festival, was Ruth's. Yeah. It's appropriate that it should be, because it needs someone as an advocate. It needs someone excited to say, I love this, and the reason I love it um, is for these is the following, and by the way, my love of it I hope will in, infect you and in, in, encourage you to love it as well. Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. We've come to the end of the session. Really? Yes. <laughs> Watch <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, ten years ago, Abu Dhabi Music and Arts Foundation set up the Abu Dhabi Festival. Uh, in the Cultural Foundation in Abu Dhabi with a few thousand people. Today, the Abu Dhabi Fest Festival engages with 29,000 people. We've embarked on a journey. We've passed a decade so far, and we, we hope to continue long into the future. As, as Jonathan Ruth Noir has said, the arts, whether you are a practitioner or a member of the audience engaging with the experience, you are on a journey. And we hope that you will join us on our journey of discovery. Um, and it's all about, whenever you're doing anything, it's all about the psychology, the psychology of the place, of the environment, and the psychology 
of the people that you wish to engage with. I think we learned that there. And that it's a long-term organic development. Creating audiences, building audiences, building that microsystem that an arts experience gives is a long-term effort. But use technology. I see you with your iPhones and your iPads and your iWatchable callings. Use them, integrate them, use them to find your voice. And we look forward for you to coming to the next event that you curate. Now we're actually going on after this to a wonderful exhibition. Jonathan, you mentioned earlier about the collective memory. There's an exhibition not far from here called Lest We Forget, which is based on photographs from the family archives of some of our students. Um, and they worked with uh, Susan Marcellus, a wonderful <coughs> magnum photographer. So we're gonna see some, something in action now. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as we have. Thank you.